just about five o'clock and I see everybody starting to come in. Um, as we're getting ready to get started, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Laura DiMarcantonio, I'm the Assistant Dean of Recruitment and Admissions and uh, wanna welcome all of you and also just let you know that we are going to be recording today's session uh, for many students who I know wanted to attend and weren't able to be here. So we are gonna be recording and placing this out on the School of Social Works YouTube channel. That's always a follow-up question that we get for these sessions. Where can you uh, watch the rest of it or uh, watch it again or share with a friend? So it will be out on the School of Social Works YouTube channel in the next week. Um, you are joining us for our special presentation of what is environmental justice and uh, I happen to know the speakers today fairly well, so I can tell you you're in for a really fun and engaging presentation. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and hit our record button here. Oh, somebody already beat me to it. Thank you very much, Karen. Uh, so I'll go ahead and introduce you to our speakers today for, as I said, our, our special presentation, What is Environmental Justice? Uh, we have Christine Morales here with us today, who serves as the Assistant Director in Admissions, uh, and she's also an Assistant Professor of Teaching here at the Rucker School of Social Work. Professor Morales has areas of expertise that include foster care and adoption, uh, organizational management, outcome-driven programming, and career development and training. We also have Marianne Bischoff, who is uh, also an Assistant Professor of Teaching, as well as a management and policy field specialist. And Professor Bischoff's areas of practice include social work field education, uh, international development, clinical supervision, mindfulness, self-care, parenting, addictions, domestic abuse, as well as organizational learning and process improvements. And I will mention that Professor Bischoff and Professor Morales are both uh, licensed clinical social workers. We also have Sean, Sean Ertl here, who's a current MSW student and very enthusiastic to be completing his social work internship in environmental justice. Uh, he earned his bachelor's degree in history from Keene University before beginning here. And he's currently earning his degree while also working at a school for children with autism. So thank you to all of our presenters and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Laura. Welcome friends, it's great to be with you today. I'm so excited you chose to join us. And as we get started, the first thing we wanted to do was to acknowledge, do a land acknowledgement. So we acknowledge that Rutgers University operates on the traditional unceded territory of the Lene Lenape people. And I hope you find this quote from indigenous social worker, Leah Prusher, as powerful as we do along the lines of our land acknowledgement. So here goes, just as seasons shift and migration patterns modify in response to human impact, so too must social work. Along with the human contingency silenced by oppression, climate change disproportionately burdens the voiceless. The rooted, meaning plants, nibi, water, aki, earth, winged, four-legged swimmers and crawlers. Thank you for joining us in that land acknowledgement. And I wanted to say a few words about this slide. Um, this is a quote from Audre Lorde. When I dare to be powerful, to use my strength in the service of my vision, then it becomes less and less important whether I am afraid. I carried a postcard with a picture of Audre Lorde on it, not this one, and the same, um, the same quote for many, many years. I found it really helpful and powerful whenever I felt um, that I should be standing up for something or driven to or I wanted to, and it helps me get over any fear that I had. So now we're gonna go to the next slide and introduce ourselves. Um, so I'm Marianne Bischoff. Uh, Laura said a little bit about me. I wanted to just say how I got into environmental justice. So Christine Morales and I um, had this famous water cooler conversation which kicked everything off. And we were talking about how is it that we have to pay for water? Like, how did that happen? People years ago probably couldn't imagine that. I wonder what else is coming. When are we gonna have to pay for air? And that sort of kicked off our work together where we developed um, an environmental justice course 
but I guess what set me up, like everything's a continuation, right? So what set me up for that was just growing up where my dad had us out in nature all the time, planting things out on lakes, in woods, noticing all the interconnections of everything. And I found nature so powerful for me. I felt like it, especially during adolescence, when times were hard, I felt like the nature around me was sort of holding difficult things for me. And I wonder if I visit those places again, if I would find the things that it was holding for me. And so I just thought, why is it that in social work, we don't have an environmental justice course? And from there, I'll turn it on to Christine. Yes, thanks, Marianne. So um, what's my what's my origin story with environmental justice? I mean, really, I am a city girl, but my my town actually has um, a landfill and I'm located next to an incinerator. So environmental injustices have always been integrated in my life somehow. I think it became more prominent more recently when I started culinary school, which I did not finish, but that's a different story altogether. Um, and in culinary school, we were learning about like responsible meat raising. Um, and that really just started opening my eyes to wait, how come I'm privileged, which I recognize, um, and I can buy responsibly raised meat. Why is responsibly raised meat more expensive, right? And so that conversation started um, internally, which led me to my conversation with Marianne at the water cooler. Um, and so we started doing work on environmental justice and then we decided to take on an intern, which leads me to Sean. Hello, everyone. Um, yes, my name is Sean Ertle. Um, I'm an MSW candidate in the online program. So I'm just about, I think actually this week or last week was my halfway point through the program. Um, I started in the spring 2020 semester and projected to graduate um, following the fall 2022 semester. The online program is it's part time, so it's three years. Um, and I've always loved and been passionate about animals, um, nature, the environment, like the planet. And I've always wanted to, since I was, since I was younger, I've always wanted to help however I could. And like, I've always wanted to help people too. Um, the problem was I just never really knew how to, or, or knew how to, to make, um, you know, a bigger difference. So entering this program, I, I knew this was a great way to help, but again, I didn't know how, I didn't know what exactly. Um, everyone asked me, well, what do you want to do? Work with kids? Because as, as Laura mentioned, I work in the school for children with autism. And my answer was, was always the same anytime I was asked. Honestly, I have no idea. I just want to help. That's what I know. Um, so fast forward to the start. First semester, not even two months in, um, I found out what I wanted to do. It was, excuse me, um, a module in my diversity and oppression course that was about environmental justice. Um, and everything that day changed for me. And, and for my life, I was so excited. I texted my sister that night and I told her I, I had found out what I wanted to do. Um, you know, I had found my career path. And if it wasn't for this program, I wouldn't have found that and I wouldn't have been able to do the work here um, with Marianne and Christine in environmental justice. So now we're gonna continue on. Thanks, Sean. So that um, module on um, environmental justice and DNO is a perfect segue um, for our little commercial, uh, shameless plug for our class that we created, which is environmental justice. Um, so we do have a course elective. We hope that everyone here who is in the traditional program um, will consider it. In the past, we've offered it in uh, Newark and New Brunswick. But of course, you know the flexibility of this program. So if you are not on one of those campuses as a traditional student, you still have the capacity to register for it if it's on a different ca campus. Again, of course, always talk to your academic advisor, always, always. Um, but that environmental justice course, we hope will be available in the spring. And the course number, I mean, write it down if you want, or you can reach out to us. Um, it's. 553, five, five, that's our particular course. 
All right. Okay. okay. So now I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Uh, so Christine can take over because we're going to do a little activity. Um, for this, all you'll either need to do is perfect. Marianne just um, provided the link in the chat, so you can click that. Um, or you can text Christine Moore 715 to 37607, and I'll put that in the chat as well. Um, so what you're going to do is, once you get to the website, type a one-word answer to the question, what do you think of when you hear environmental justice? And again, um, just one-word responses will be perfect. Yeah, just one word. Otherwise, if you put two words, it'll divide it up and look like two different entries. And then it seems really funny. People try to just, put a whole sentence. Just double checking. Can you see my screen? Yes. Awesome. Okay. Just need you all to respond. Okay, we see some responses. Smog. Yes. Let's see. So just so you all know what happens is um, as the word repeats, it gets bigger. So inequality, absolutely. Climate, resources, impact. Bring them on. There's no wrong answer. I should, we should also stress that. Every answer is right. This actually reminds me, as you text, I'll tell you the story. Marianne and I do a lot of presentations about um, environmental justice. And um, people are always asking about how it relates to social work. Um, and I always refer to that movie. I don't know if anyone's ever seen My Big Fat Greek Wedding, where the father, he's very proud of his Greek heritage. And he says, give me a word and I'll tell you how the root is um, Greek. And so that's how Marianne and I are. We're like, give me a, a social um, condition or a social issue. And we'll tell you how it's related to environmental injustice. So again, no wrong answer. Insecurity. Um, we'll give one more second for people. What do you think, Marianne? Do you think they need more time, Sean? Um, I think we're good. Okay. So the biggest word I see is inequality. Okay. Thank you all. Now we have insight to what you all are thinking. I'm going to stop sharing. Yeah, it's great to get to know everyone a little bit. So it's, I'm thinking what it might be like to be in your shoes. So that's one thing that we do as social workers. We call it beginning where the client is or where the client is at. Either way, it doesn't seem grammatically correct, but you begin where the client is. You imagine what the audience, how the audience is feeling, what they're thinking, where they're at. And so I'm wondering, wow, you're coming to this um, summer series and you're just starting your program and it must be really exciting and maybe scary at the same time. And so this definition, I wanted to tell you a little bit about how we came to this definition and um, also hopefully inspire you a little bit with it. So when, we, when Christine and I started teaching about environmental justice, we looked up definitions. And one definition was from the EPA. And that's not the one that's on the screen. We've moved on since then. The definition from the EPA is that environmental justice is the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people, regardless of race, color, national origin, or income with respect to the development, implementation, and enforcement of environmental laws, regulations, and policies. And that didn't seem bad at all. But as time went on, we started to develop our own definitions and our own models of things. And I'm saying this to really encourage you to do that too, because the world doesn't have the answers. We need you to have the answers and you have them within you. 
And so Christine wrote this um, definition in one of her papers. And I was like, we need to use that all the time. That's better. So here it is. Environmental justice will be generally defined as the well-being of the earth, its ecosystems, and its inhabitants. So I just love it how it's the well-being of the earth. So it's not so person-centered. And I don't know, we don't really have time for everyone to respond right here. We're going to have more time, but I'm just wondering if you could take a few minutes to think about how that lands on you, the difference of the definitions, and to really encourage you when you think you have a better definition or a better model to really put it forward um, throughout your career here at Rutgers and beyond. All right. And the next slide, I think, Sean? Yes, sir. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk um, a little bit about some environmental crises, um, and then we're going to watch a trailer to the film The Sacrifice. Um, before I begin, though, I would just like to say that these crises, um, they can be overwhelming. Um, they can cause some uncomfortable feelings, but that is natural. Um, and it is okay not undermining the feelings themselves. Um, while I know, again, it may be uncomfortable, sitting with those feelings and not jumping to action right away can actually be helpful. Often in our society, we sometimes want to fix things right away. Um, that we sometimes forget to take the time and critically think about the issues as well as um, the solutions. So with that being said, following the trailer, um, we're gonna do a mindful breathing exercise and then we can discuss um, what, you, what everyone thought about the trailer. So as a planet, we're currently facing a lot of different environmental crises. Um, just some common popular ones are climate change, pollution, which includes air pollution, uh, water contamination, land contamination, noise and light pollution. All of these problems have a significant impact on the planet, um, the environment and its inhabitants. Oppressed and vulnerable populations are actually impacted more than their counterparts um, by these environmental crises. And one of the reasons of that is because some of the individuals live in communities or areas that are referred to as sacrifice zones. Uh, so a sacrifice zone, which is gonna be explained in the trailer we watch is an area where the lives of the individuals living there do not matter as much. Um, it's, it's, it's deep, um, it's definitely impactful. And then so now, or just let me know, um, maybe Christine, if you, can you hear it? Yeah. Around our country, we're replete with examples of certain communities basically becoming warehouses for toxic facilities. Most of the industrial legacy for the city of Newark lies in the iron bound. There's just so many things in a concentrated area that's less than a mile from where all the residents are. You're not just breathing in one chemical at a time or one pollutant at a time. You're exposed to a barrage of pollutants. We're the ones that live with the impacts of mass consumption. People think you need a hurricane to do this. We don't, we just need a day full of rain. And not everyone lives this way. We're seeing incidents of high levels of congenital heart failure, of asthma, and children having learning disabilities. I can't call it anything else but a sacrifice zone. A zone that's been deemed these lives don't matter as much. We can't keep sitting back and letting generations be affected by this. To create change, you can't let anybody take away your power or your community's power. So very, um, very, very impactful stuff. Again, very deep stuff. Last semester, um, Marianne and Christine and I, we represented the School of Social Work and along with the um, School of Public Affairs and Administration, we did a film screening for that event. Um, for that, that film, I mean, The Sacrifice Zone. And 
um, there was representatives from Newark there, and it, it was it was great. We we had great discussions about it. Um, I encourage anyone to to check out that film if they ever can. Um, yeah, Christine, looks like you want to say something. Yeah, thanks, Sean. That's a good reminder for all incoming students. You have access to Rutgers Library. And so Marianne and I were able to secure this film, The Sacrifice Zone. It is available through Rutgers Library um, for your viewing. Um, now, we know that was, um, I, I think it was pretty powerful given that it was less than two minutes. And we wanted to open it up to you. You could put it in the chat. Let us know how did that land on you? Um, in fact, if you want to raise your hand, I think I can give you the power to speak. So uh, if you raise your hand, I can unmute you and you can let us know what was your reaction to the film? Any thoughts? So I do see one hand up. Caroline, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you. Okay. Caroline, you can unmute. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, so I grew up in Camden in South Jersey and it's the same thing we have with the incinerator that's in South Camden and um, some of the land down there, it's um, gated and um, they don't even want individuals anywhere near the land because it's toxic, so many um, so many cases of children having the same thing, developmental disorders, cancer, asthma, and it's a dumping ground. Um, that's where all of the sewage in this area goes. And um, New York, it, as soon as I saw that, I've seen this film before, it's very heartbreaking. As soon as I saw it, I said, there it goes, Camden, again, yeah. where poor people live. It's heartening, it's heartening. Yeah. Thank you, Carolyn. Uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, that it's the pattern that we'll notice with regard to where these locations, where these facilities, whether it's um, incinerators or whether it is dumping grounds or even uh, warehouses or uh, factories that produce like toxic emissions where they're located. Um, and there is Robert Bullard. I think it's also important to, to name uh, Dr. Robert Bullard. He is known as the father of the environmental justice movement. In the 1970s, he uh, testified for his wife, um, attorney Linda Bullard, in the first uh, lawsuit of its kind, where it's the people of Houston uh, were suing a land waste management organization, and they were citing environmental racism, saying that the locations of where they were polluting were um, intended intentionally impacting and harming uh, people of color and people with low socioeconomic status. And you will find that trend, unfortunately, um, in many areas, so thank you. So was there any other comments? I didn't miss any chats, did I? Did anyone else wanna say anything? Nikki, I see your comment. I'll just read it out. This is something that's been a topic of discussion in my house. Father talks about bringing factories back to the country is what we need, but would not live next to it himself. Yeah, that's really interesting. And we talk about that, Marianne, I don't know if you wanna unmute. We talk about that in our class and how we talk about the setup of the economy and how there's often this uh, narrative that pits environmental justice against uh, economic health and well-being. And we like to envision ways where you can have both environmental justice and economic health. Right. And so one of the things we do in the class is we actually read the Green New Deal, which you could go online and read in like 10 minutes, because although it's this huge, amazing bill that was introduced to Congress, it's really not that long at all. Um, and that idea of the Green New Deal would be economics that are also friendly to the earth and sustainable. Yeah. So 
Yeah, you know, Kristen, uh, thanks for mentioning good reminder. Um, so we often talk about, we have a different uh, workshop where we talk about interventions. And so sometimes it can feel really overwhelming, um, which is why I'm about to do an exercise with you all. But I also want to empower you and encourage you that, you know, you have action and you have agency that is helpful. Um, so whether you make um, actions or change your behavior in your personal level, or perhaps in micro social work practice, which is one on one, meso social work practice, which is like groups, or macro social work practice, which is like larger communities and policies, uh, you have the ability to affect change, right? So I want to take a second. We decided to insert this uh, three six press um, activity. It's actually research based. To really relax you. So even if you're not um, stressed out um, because of this uh, workshop, or maybe you're stressed out because of something else totally different, we're hoping that this could be helpful to you. So what 3-6 press is, before we do it, is three seconds for an inhale through your nose. And then in that same breath, it's six seconds exhale through your mouth. And while you're doing that, you're pressing on something. Usually people have their hands down on their knees and they're pressing on their knees, um, but it's your body, it's your decision. If you don't wanna press, you don't have to, but if you wanna, let's say press this way or even like press your face again, there's no wrong answer. So while you're breathing, you wanna press. Okay, so bringing attention to your body. So we're gonna do a few rounds with you. Make sure everyone's calm and ready. So again, it's three, six, while you're pressing. And we're gonna take a deep breath in. Two, three, and then we're gonna exhale. Six, you're pressing. And then inhale. One, two, three, and then exhale. Six, do another one, inhale, three, exhale, six, let's do one more, three, two, three, six. Okay, I might have fallen asleep for a second, <laughs> but I'm back. Hopefully you're all feeling calm, not feeling too overwhelmed by the challenges that the earth faces. And I'm gonna hand it back to Sean. Thank you, Christine, and thank you for that. Um, before I, I speak on, on the code of ethics, um, I just wanna point out, uh, David, that is a great, a great video. I, I had to watch it, I wasn't sure might've been for that environmental um, justice module I was speaking of, or maybe a, another class, but I, I definitely had to watch that. And it was it was definitely an incredible video for sure. Um, she does great work. Um, so thank you for that suggestion. So um, before I, I explain briefly the, the code of ethics, um, I know for your acceptance paperwork while, while filling it out, you had to check a box um, acknowledging that you read the Code of Ethics. So to anyone that maybe hasn't or they might have um, not understood it fully, I, I definitely encourage anyone to read them um, because they are, they are very important for social work practice. So the National Association of Social Workers Code of Ethics, they're a set of standards that, that guide our profession. They, they guide the social work profession and guide social workers to conduct themselves professionally um, and most importantly, in the best interest of their clients. The mission of a social work profession is rooted in a set of core values. Um, again, the, the purpose of social work and, and the profession is to promote and enhance human and community well being, especially vulnerable and oppressed populations. Um, this is done through social work that follows the six principles seen here um, service, social justice dignity and worth of the person, importance of human relationships, integrity and competence. 
and these are all applicable to environmental justice, social work practice as well. And then I just wanted to highlight um, an ethical standard uh, 6.01 social welfare that's under the standard six social workers ethical responsibility to the broader society. Um, that standard states social workers should promote the general welfare of society from local to global levels and the development of people, their communities and their environments. Um, as I mentioned before, vulnerable and oppressed populations experience environmental justices uh, and those crises more often. Um, as I, I think it was Caroline, or Carolyn, I'm sorry. Um, she had brought up Camden and seen Newark in the film. So these communities, um, they're oppressed populations and, and they're experiencing them. Um, to, to Nikki's point with her question, and this isn't just to her dad, it's to everyone. Um, they want more factories, but they don't want to live next to them. So that, the question has to be asked, who, who lives next to them? Um, and, and, and we, we've seen time and time again, the answer to that. So that's where social work comes in. That's where social work practice and, and professionals can help. Um, these are populations that social workers deal with and work with every day. Um, so, and, and, and work for their best, best interest. Um, so social work can, can, can really help these people and, and, and these situations. Okay, yeah, just so, to jump okay. in, I mean, one Please. part about social work is that I feel like we, community organizing is a big part of social work. And sometimes you're doing community organizing and you don't realize it. you're in a different type of job, a different type of position, your job title isn't community organizing, but you're bringing people together, you're helping people advocate for themselves, whether on a micro level, a meso level or a macro level. So I just wanted to add that to what you were saying, Sean. No, Marianne, if I may, there's a question in the chat from Lauren um, that I'd like to open up. It says, how do social workers get involved with environmental justice? What types of organizations would they work for? Um, and so this kind of relates, I wish we had the model. Um, we could demonstrate it, we can show it to people. But the reality is there are organizations that do specifically environmental justice work, like the Climate Justice Alliance. Um, but we, going back to my comment about like uh, my big fat Greek wedding, if you give me an issue, I'll relate it to um, environmental justice. It's kind of similar, meaning um, we're if there's an organization, let's just say it's a nonprofit organization that does foster care and adoption, bringing this up because this is an actual experience that I've had, right? So in foster care and adoption, I have had, um, there was a time where I oversaw um, many group homes and I had a foster mother. And in this foster mother, she cared for over 112 children in her um, tenure. And we took in children that were medically needy. And I don't know if anyone is familiar, but children that are medically needy were typically those who were like drug exposed. Um, so they were often very colicky and difficult to settle. And what my experienced foster mother noticed was that one way to calm the children down was to take them out for a walk. She noticed that they something happened. They like they would pay attention to the wind on their face, or they would look at the aesthetics of the leaves and look at nature around them, and they would listen, you know, um, for sounds like nature sounds. So then, this knowledge that came up in this foster care world that I was working in was that the environment was intrinsically linked to children's health. So I'm using this as an example because if you're doing foster care and adoption, there is still opportunity to incorporate the environment and environmental justice in that, right? Um, I, I don't know if anyone else wants to add. Yeah, so Christine mentioned a model and I'll just share my screen really briefly if you let me, Sean. Um, we really can't go through the whole thing, but it is, it is a question that I think comes up a lot is like, how can I do this? And that's sort of where, what we came up with the course from like, what, where, where do we find ourselves and what can we do related to environmental justice? But, um, 
what we did at one point was we created a model because we didn't find one. And that's, are you guys seeing it? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So basically there's three different theories that we talk about, eco, eco social work, green social work, and a native or indigenous perspective. I don't really want to go into that now because of our time constraints, but different theories about how social workers can do environmental justice work. And what I wanted to focus more on was the four levels on the top. Like it sort of needs to be on a personal level. And you can be working on a micro, on a meso, and on a macro level. There's ways to do environmental justice work on all those different levels. And what we really found in, in talking to so many different people through presentations and courses and just common interests is that when people are doing macro work, they also have some kind of personal connection to nature and to the environment and to reducing, reusing, and recycling like the song some of you might've heard at the beginning mentioned. Um, so it's, it's really all over and maybe you're getting a chance to read a little bit of it. On micro level, it can be things like horticultural therapy, pet therapy. On, on a macro level, it can be that kind of community organizing, doing things on a much larger level. So I just wanted to, I, I feel like this model helps people realize that wherever you're working, you're part of the solution and you don't need to work on every level. You can't, it's not possible. Um, but there's work for everyone. I will stop sharing unless Christine or Sean wanted to say anything about it. I was going to say, I love that you said the fact that you can't work on every level. It, that actually um, leads me to answering the next question that we have. I don't know if it's live, but I'll read it out loud. It says, is there any proven link with environment and autism? And, you know, I will to just tell you very honestly, I am not familiar with that research. It's very specific. Um, but Marianne and I were talking about how there's always research to prove anything or disprove anything. So um, unfortunately, I do not have the answer for that. And I think, Sean, you look like you're gearing up for the video and I think it's appropriate. I did wanna just clarify. I see that you've marked a few questions um, as answered. I just wanna make sure we're clear that we had played the first video, which was the Sacrifice Zone. And the Sacrifice Zone video is available through Rutgers Library. But then the second video that was mentioned in the chat was Greening the Ghetto. Um, and Sean, that's a TED Talks, right? Yeah. TED Talks. Yeah, I, I, I'm trying to remember. I think it was maybe like 19 minutes or it, it, like the, I feel like typical range. Um, but yeah, it was it was she she the woman who who presents like the the work she's done in, in that community is it's like on a riverfront in in the Bronx and it's great. Awesome, thank you. And now we're going to show you a third video, um, and I'll give it back to Sean. Uh, yes, so. So as Christine just said, we're gonna watch um, another one. And this one's about seven minutes long, but I think it does a, a, an amazing job on illustrating why environmental justice is so important, um, especially again, to those vulnerable communities uh, that social workers work with. Um, I think it's awesome to see the next generation um, and the youth like find their voices and, and, and get involved and work together. So with that being said, again, just make sure Young people of color have historically been on the front lines of struggle and social change. Now, we are facing a climate emergency. All over the world, communities are devastated by the rising tides, storms, fires, horrors, and miseries provoked by climate change. This is Democracy Now! I'm Amy Goodman as we continue to look at the devastating Hurricane Dorian. Her op-ed in the New York Times headlined, Hurricane Dorian makes Bahamians the latest climate crisis victims. We've been the ones affected, our communities, the low-income black, brown communities, have been the ones affected since slavery, since colonization, since the genocide of indigenous people. We keep on fighting, keep on fighting.
having young people know about these things and have an understanding of how different things like migration, like policing, like displacement are, are connected to climate change is really important. Once again, the youth are at the forefront of the climate justice movement while ushering clean and just solutions to their communities. All the while fighting against the culprits of climate destruction in their communities and winning. Well, it has been a problem since it opened 33 years ago, but now the Detroit incinerator has suddenly closed for good. We seen it on the news. They didn't even call us and tell us. They let us find out on the news. So we're sitting there chatting about how school was and stuff like that. I'm like, yeah, I'm like, oh my God, y'all, look, 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 they shut it down. You know, I got all types of text messages to my phone, everybody just excited. We did a mental health campaign with another youth organization called CPA. We did an art event, so we had people from the community. Mental health was really important to us, and Poder, they're the one of the reasons why I know a lot about mental health and like why it's important to like um, spread awareness about it. So I think Poder, like, they just, they give us information and like they help us. They're like, what do you want to do? And how do you want to let people know about it? People that are going through the same struggle that you don't, that they don't know is happening to them. Something that we did back home at the Kepper Institute in Indianapolis was create a community controlled food initiative where we outreach to local urban farmers to come to the city and give uh, fruits and vegetables to those um, people who needed food after the food chain store had closed and we were able to increase the farmers social capital. Um, so they were not only like being able to sell their produce but people now knew about them and their farms can be better supported. A mí ese es el reto más grande de la cuestión económica, de dónde nos sustentamos. Y, y pienso que estrategias para eso, a ver, que tienen que ver justo con el cambio climático también. O sea, eso, esto es un círculo de muchas cosas que suceden. También es eh, generar microempresas dentro de la propia comunidad que sustenten a la gente de la comunidad y a la vez que están dentro, podemos ver qué es lo que nos afecta en el medio ambiente. We have a lot of problems with the militarism in San Antonio. It's actually called Military City, Kelly Air Force Base. Um, they dumped a lot of chemicals into the ground and every time it rains, the chemicals get spread. It takes a lot of contamination to the communities around it, especially low-income communities, brown, black communities. I'm from North New Jersey. I'm an environmental justice leader there. Here at the ICC, I rock the I do a lot of community organizing in my area. Me coming out here and talking for them, you know, it just warms my heart and I love doing it. We run a garden program every Saturday in North New Jersey for the kids, you know, we have, we teach them gardening, we teach them harvesting and growing crops. We also teach justice and, you know, know your rights. Really what got me connected to the land was just seeing uh, people, people my color and people of my age really making a difference in the community, reconnecting the lines with the elders, um, doing uh, a lot of workshops and a lot of produce markets um, for, the, for the inner city kids. And just, I seen the way that, that food changed uh, people's attitudes. And I seen how um, the garden brought serenity and harmony to, to people's lives. <laughs> One person can change a lot. We all come from different places. We all come from like Guam, Puerto Rico. I think that's really important and not just in the United States. You know, people need to come together as a whole. It has to be intergenerational, it has to be youth aligned, it has to be frontline, community aligned. We have to be able to learn from those who came before us. The front lines have been leading on solutions for a long time and that we are building is for a just transition and that climate change conversations can't happen without that framework. What gives me hope is seeing like organizations like when I work for ICC, you know, just go out there and every day fight for the community, fight for climate justice. When the grids go down and when the government shuts down our, our cities and, 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 and our countries and continents, well, we won't have anything to rely on. You know, people are going to be running to the farmers. People are going to be running for these, for these resources that they don't have. How do you feel being involved in this movement? I feel empowered. I feel like I'm 
bigger than I actually am. I feel like I'm part of something that's going to be great, part of something that's going to make history. You know, everybody knows the system rejects that, but if you don't fight to change it, what's going to happen? It's going to stay the same, it's going to get worse, it's going to keep affecting us in a bad way. So I feel like as long as we're fighting, you know, we're already winning. quizás ni terminó la escuela, eso es real y a pocas cosas hace caso, lo importante es tener comida y agua en el vaso, aunque se vive arropado por la contaminación, uno que otro va abrazado al polvo de la adicción. Ok, so, we need to take another minute. Thanks for the applause, Sean, and <laughs> take another oh, minute. Here we are. I'm just wondering, um, does anyone have any thoughts? I see Madeline has her hand raised. I'm going to go ahead and allow you to speak. You can go ahead and unmute, Madeline. Madeline, are you there? So, I'm going to give you a few minutes to figure out maybe you want to unmute or put your response in the chat, but I also want to open it up to anyone else, anyone out there in the audience that wants to respond. How did that land on you? Any thoughts they might be having about what we've discussed so far? I'm, I'll reflect a little bit here. I'm just watching it uh, again. The the one woman at the end, the girl at the end, she had said, even if we're fighting, we're winning. And I think that kind of goes to the, the, the feeling, the overwhelming feeling of some of these situations, um, some of these issues that, that, that communities face is like, or climate change, right? It's so overwhelming uh, that you kind of just want to stop and give up. Well, like, you know, if you're, if you're fighting for it, you're winning. Um, and I, I, I think that's important. That's a good mindset to have um, you know, when facing these issues and, and, and these problems. Thanks, Sean. See some comments in the chat. Yeah, definitely the youth, they're amazing. Um, yeah. So, so some, some of the comments in the chat go to just the panelists and some go to all the attendees. So I want to just read the one from Nina because it went to just the panelists. It says it was inspiring to see those young kids taking great local action. I appreciated them pushing back against larger systems while at the same time doing things like farm to community engagement to better folks' individual health. Thanks, Marianne. Thank you. If you have any other thoughts, you can keep throwing them in the chat or again, you can raise your hand and we can unmute you. And again, from Nina, so many of the bigger climate issues are because of big corporations. It really feels like we're all the David in this huge Goliath. And that makes me think about self-care, you know, like if you're thinking that you're fighting this huge, huge issue, which there's been many, many huge, huge issues over thousands of years that people have fought. Um, so how do you, how do you keep doing that? How do you take care of yourself? How do you sustain yourself? And I think the answer may be different for, I'm sure it's different for people, but one thing that's true for me, and I think I've heard other people say is also like the community that you build when you're doing this kind of work and the deep connections that you make with people who are so amazing and so passionate. And for me, it's like always the diversity. Like I just, I don't feel like myself unless I'm around really, really different people. And so to be working on a common issue with people who see things all different ways and come from all different backgrounds, it's, it's life to me. It's so invigorating. So 
So while we're fighting these hard issues, I feel like we have to find what's nourishing us, or maybe we choose to fight in a certain area because that will be nourishing, whereas another area, the fight may just be draining. And Madeline says they represent our future and it's great to see them so passionate about the change. Marion, I don't know if you want to ask or about the last slide. Well, so um, we have this question here. What does your, oops. Um, I was just gonna sit, have people do the, the chat exercise. If you could go back one slide, Sean. Oh, yes. So the question is, what does your connection for Earth mean to you? So if anybody wants to just put in the chat, we thought you could like put a word, don't send it yet. And we're gonna wait and we'll all hit enter at the same time. So at least we'll be connected in some way. We try to do what we can with Zoom. So the panelists can do that as well. Um, the facilitators. So what does your connection to Earth mean to you. And it can be one word or more words. And I'll give you a, just a minute and then we'll we'll say go and you can all hit enter. And could you put it all, make sure that you're sending it to all panelists and attendees. So right above where you're typing, it may just say to all panelists. And if you click down on the down carrot and change it to all panelists and attendees, then everyone will see it. Okay, I'm going to say one, two, three, and everyone can hit enter. One, two, three. Yay, now I have to make the box bigger. So what do we have? Spirituality. It's my happy place. Love and life. Love. Precious. Home. Going outside. Hiking. Being in nature. All that feels like homecoming. Earth is life. Without it, we are none. Unity, health, respect, life, lucky, freedom, connection. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for, for all those responses. And I'm going to read this quote. Um, sometimes when we're thinking that we want to help people. A lot of people go into social work because they want to help people and that helping can kind of have like a paternalistic um, aspect to it where um, there can be just many negative aspects of, of helping from the position of I'm strong and you're weak and I'm going to help you. And so we really love this quote, found it a while ago and um, hopefully you'll hear it again during your MSW. So it says, if you have come to help me, you're wasting your time. But if you have come because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us work together. And that's from Lilla Watson, who's a Muri visual artist. So at the end of trainings that we've been to, I know many times Marianne and I and Sean will go to training and we learn about all these things and then we're like, okay, now what? What do we do? Um, how can we take this energy and put it somewhere? Um, and oftentimes nobody can give us exactly where we can put our energies because we're the only ones that know our expertise and know our outlets and our connections. But I promise you, there is a space that you can do the work. I was fortunate to be at a talk with uh, Naomi Klein um, and also, of course, now the other individual is escaping my mind. Um, but so at the end of the talk, they were talking about how um, your efforts are needed. Even if you think they're small, there is a space at the table for you. Uh, you just need to make your space. And I wanna add it on the adage that if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. So we encourage you to find your space and we welcome you. Um, Marianne and Christine, this might be directed to you. Is this course, it's not, it's only offered to traditional, right? The environmental justice. So Nikki, um, yeah, I think it's just the traditional. Um, yeah, for, for now it's in the traditional program. 
And Marianne, my my wonderful friend, reminded me of Winona Leduc. How could I have forgotten? It was Winona Leduc who said that. Um, being at the table, making a space for yourself. So any questions, thoughts, anything you want to share? We can unmute you. And while maybe people are typing or, or anything, I just want to say, uh, my email is here, it's, it's, it's up here. Um, please do not hesitate if, if anyone wants to email me about anything, um, you know, questions, concerns about the program, um, or semester, you know, the feelings that come along with it. Um, you know, and not, not too long ago, I was in this exact position. So um, I, can, I can identify with some of those feelings maybe. Um, and um, we're in it together and, I, and I'm just happy that this many people have attended um, and, and have given an interest here as, as we did this presentation. Um, so you're all gonna do great work and, and wonderful. Looks like chat has some stuff let's take a look. So Nikki has a question in the chat that warms my heart. Is there an MSW environmental justice group? Um, I mean, it's really us in the panel right now, <laughs> for now, but we are certainly interested in making it grow. We have um, joined forces with other groups um, who are in like the biological sciences um, and environmental sciences, and we participate by going to their events. And we've heard um, on several occasions that we are the only social workers, Marianne and I, that ever attends um, the environmental summits that are not specific to social work. But yeah, I mean, you can always reach out to us. And I know that, uh, I don't know if this is too soon to say, I know we were talking about to NASW about possibly reviving because they had an environmental justice group, um, but nothing that I can say with confirmation at this point. Um, so, oh, okay. And then the next question that I see is about any books. Uh, yeah, there's a ton. Um, so one that we use in our class is from Lena Dominelli. And her book is literally called The Green Social Work. Look how handy that one. Text, right? <laughs> then there's another book. It's a little bit older. It is called um, Environmental Social Work. It's an edited book, but this is what the cover looks like. So there's Green Social Work by um, Lena Dominelli, Environmental Social Work, and the editors are Greg Coates and Harrington. And of course, this one, which Marianne put me up on, which is Decolonizing Social Work. This is another one. So these are the three that I would suggest. And I put them in the chat. Thank you. Just the names. But feel free to reach out to us if you have trouble finding anything. Nikki, we see, I saw your comment. Yeah, let us know when there's an event. We'll come sit next to you um, if, it's, if, if you're okay with that. <laughs> I'm all inviting myself in the seat next to Nikki. <laughs> <laughs> let us know. We'll go. So um, can you hear me? Mm-hmm. Okay. So, oh yeah, Nikki, you were saying about working together. Okay. I think Christine already commented on that, but yeah, it's us creating it really. It's all about us creating it. It's not like it's there out there waiting, waiting for us to join. Thanks for your comment, Sam. He loves the phrase. If you're not at the table, you're on the menu. All right. well, this this has been wonderful to spend the afternoon, the late afternoon with all of you. I hope it was at once inspiring and uh, motivating and not too traumatizing. <laughs> it's always a balance, but I've enjoyed the connection. So thank you so much. Thank you. Hope you have a good evening and we look forward to you joining us or continuing because we have some advanced standing students here. You've got it. Be well, everyone.
Sorry, Madeline, we couldn't hear you. I see your hand's still up. Thanks, Laura. I always feel like the gracious host that waits till everyone exits. So glad Nikki said that's exactly what I was looking for. Awesome. 